Have you ever had trouble installing a package you wanted to use in your Python app? Likely it contains some odd dependency, required a compilation step, maybe even using an uncommon compiler like Fortran. Did you try this on Windows? How many times have you seen cannot find vcvarsall.bat before you have to take a walk? If this sounds familiar, you might want to check out the Conda package manager, Anaconda the distribution, Conda Forge, and Conda Build. Together, these dramatically lower the bar for installing packages across all the platforms. This week, you'll meet Phil Ellison, Kale Franz, and Michael Sarahan, who all work on various parts of this ecosystem. This is Talk Python to Me, episode 94, recorded December 14th, 2016. I'm a developer in many senses of the word Cause I make these applications But I also use these verbs to make this music I construct it line by line Just like when I'm coding another software design In both cases, it's about design patterns Anyone can get the job done, it's the execution that matters I have many interests, sometimes it can Welcome to Talk Python to Me, a weekly podcast on Python The language, the libraries, the ecosystem, and the personalities this is your host, Michael Kennedy. Follow me on Twitter where I'm at mkennedy. Keep up with the show and listen to past episodes at talkpython.fm and follow the show on Twitter via at talkpython. This episode is brought to you by MongoDB and Continuum Analytics. Thank them both for supporting the show by checking out what they have to offer during their segments. Kale, Michael, Phil, welcome to Talk Python, guys. It's great to have you here. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Good to be I'm looking forward to talking about Conda. It's going to be really fun. There's a whole ecosystem growing up around it, and I think it's a little bit underappreciated just from the people I talk to. And so I really want to spread the word about how cool Conda is and what you can do with it. So we'll get to all that. But let's start with your guys' story. How do you got into programming? And since there's three of you, let's kind of you know, keep it a little bit short. But just, Kale, maybe how do you get into programming in Python? 30 seconds. Yeah, uh, I in grad school, I was writing a lot of MATLAB code, and then MATLAB is proprietary, and this thing called NumPy came along and started using NumPy, and it kind of grew from there. Oh, that's really cool. Now you're at the very center of yep. the nucleus of NumPy and all that kind of stuff. That's great. Michael, how about you? Yeah, I started out uh, with a web program to uh, show my photos to my parents and family. And then grew into science stuff when I went to grad school, much like Kale. So, uh, yeah. Nice. What do you study in grad school? Electron microscopy. Electron microscopy. Okay. Wow. Very cool. <laughs> Lots of uh, very small things, huh? Yeah. It was that like image recognition and things like this? Yeah. And also spectral processing. So all kinds of fun signal processing and um, unsupervised learning. Oh, okay. Very cool. Phil, how about you? So I started pretty young. I um, started with Visual Basic um, when I was about... 14. And then at university, I did um, quite a bit of Maple, which is kind of a, a mathematical language, pretty similar to SymPy. And then picked up Python uh, when I was uh, in my gap year in France. So I just loved the open source community, loved the scientific Python space and went from there. Yeah, that's excellent. So you went kind of bumming around Europe and most people just hang out and <laughs> chill and you picked up Python. Very cool. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Okay. So Let's get into Conda first, and then we can get into Conda Build, Conda Forge, and, and the various things around it. So, Kale, tell us, what is Conda? Conda is a package manager. Uh, install software and, and use use software. It does a lot more than just manage packages. There, it, it manages environments. So there, Conda env or there's an environment manager and the concept of environments, much like Python virtual env, except it's it's system level and it's Python agnostic. The environment part. Oh, it's uh, language agnostic. So you can have environments for, I mean, if you want to build Ruby with it or if you, like whatever types of environments you want, completely supported. So yeah, it's package manager. Very nice. So it's kind of like PIP in some of its role, but it does more, right? In some ways it does more, in some ways it does less. So Conda the, and the Conda ecosystem is not the, the canonical source of truth for Python packages. That's PyPI, and we don't install packages directly from PyPI. Uh, that's, that's PIP's job. We don't pretend to, but we much more like a, in some ways, more like a system package manager. So more like apt-git or yum or something like that. A lot of times, 
With a system manager, you'll install Python or you'll install some of your core dependencies. The harder things that PIP will invoke a compiler for and things will crash or, or things like that. That um, I have wheels help now, but PIP still can't install Python. So things that are that are a little bit lower level is where Conda uh, really excels at. And then, uh, so, so yeah, that's the that's the trade off and capabilities, I guess. Sure. And let's see if I, I got the, the origins correctly. I'll tell you what I think and you tell me whether I'm right or wrong. So I, I feel like Conda came from, from sort of two places. It feels like it came from you guys wanted to make it easier for data scientists and people, more correctly, people working with the data science and scientific tools like NumPy and so on to actually start working with them because they often had really freaky builds. So like they might depend on some sort of Fortran thing. And so in order to pip install it, you have to have like a Fortran <laughs> compiler. A Fortran compiler. Yeah, yep. yeah. Which, I mean, we're already battling with where's vcvars.bat again on Windows. And now you're talking about Fortran compilers? <laughs> Come on. So is, is that sort of where it came from? And it had to manage all these different things like Fortran, for example? Yeah, that was the genesis. And, and Conda came about about the same time as wheels came about. So there's a little bit of two different approaches, but they've sort of diverged into really pip and wheels and things being Python specific and the source of truth for Python um, if there's not a more downstream distributor. Whereas Conda, we do take care of all the hard parts, so NumPy and SciPy and all, all those dependencies, and then Python and all the runtimes and stuff like that. Yeah, and one of the big differences is that you guys pre-build the binary pieces that we might need, right? Yeah, that's correct. So a lot of times people ship to production and absolutely do not want compilers on their production systems, and so we do ship binaries. Yeah, I find that to be really excellent because... You know, like if I go and get SQL Alchemy or I think PyMongo even, some of these things that have C speed ups at various places, often for like deserialization and serialization steps. And if I don't have the right setup, you know, maybe it's not going to work, especially if I'm on Windows. For some reason, that gets, that's a little harder to do and gets neglected often. And so it makes it like doubly hard, right? And sure. those things you don't have to worry about if I conda install it, right? Because it's already been compiled somewhere else by you guys. Not only do you not have to worry about that, but uh, you can conda install Postgres or all of your other general dependencies. It's not just Python. We have a huge R ecosystem. There's plenty of other ecosystems that, that people are language interpreter ecosystems that people are building up around. Okay. And I guess another point about conda versus a system package manager like Yum or AppGit is for your application code, you rarely want to be running the system Python. You always want to have an application-specific Python, and the OS package managers don't make that as easy. You basically have to make your own RPMs or something like that. Conda allows these isolated environments. Yeah, it absolutely does. That's very cool, very cool. Okay, so how does Conda relate to... Anaconda. Sure. Anaconda is a distribution. There's an Anaconda distribution that is a set of packages that we ship about every quarter. That is the easy way for, for scientists and engineers, data scientists, PhD students all over the world <laughs> to install most of the core Python packages that they'll need. To do that, and the package manager part then is Conda. And so you get Conda, and then when you need to install other packages from any of our repositories or anaconda.org or anything like that. Conda is the command to extend the anaconda, what you install with the anaconda distribution. Okay, so anaconda is like all that stuff pre-packaged, pre-compiled, like the major tools you want, and conda is the package manager for it. Nice. Phil, how about conda forge? Where does conda forge relate to all this? So uh, if you see anaconda as, as a nice bundled set of packages um, to install Python and all of its dependencies, then ConduForge is essentially doing the same thing, except Anaconda is managed by Continuum, and ConduForge is a community effort to kind of collaboratively to package this stuff. There are so many packages out there, right? I mean, just like you, you guys said, Conda is more than just Python, but just in Python, there's over 90,000 packages on PyPI, which is crazy, right? So you probably can't manage all of that yourself right no and so conda forge is to help crowdsource that open source that a little bit yeah exactly um it's not reasonable for us to expect continuum to package all of this stuff it just simply doesn't scale in, in that way we needed a community um effort to package some of the things that continuum aren't necessarily ever going to package at the end of the day they're business and they're 
they're there to um, su supply their customers, and that doesn't necessarily cover everybody who has various bespoke packages that need to be shipped. Yeah, absolutely. There's probably a a very quickly a small niche tail that sort of develops, right? There's, there's probably 500 or 1,000 packages that are super important, and then it becomes really niche quickly after that, right? Absolutely. That's where Condorforge started, really. I'm the author of several niche packages, um, which are extremely powerful for the people that it's targeting. But by no means would you expect that to be packaged by a, a company who are there ultimately to sell a product to their, to their customers. Um, that product may be freely available, but um, we don't have kind of, as a community, we don't have control of what's packaged and how it's packaged. Sure. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So I guess I didn't really ask, what is Conda Forge? Maybe give a, people a quick definition so they know what we're talking about. Okay, so Conda Forge, uh, in the same way uh, that Anaconda is, is a bundle of pre-compiled Conda packages, um, Conda Forge is, is exactly the same thing. It's a, it's a channel that you can enable using the Conda package manager uh, to install all of your favorite tools. And if your tools aren't available on that channel, then it's a community effort and you're welcome to contribute your package to to be bundled into the Condorge community uh, and make it widely available to Condor users. Right. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll definitely dig into that that more and how you can do that in in a little bit. But but that's great. And so, in order to deliver things in a binary form, basically compiled for Windows, compiled for Linux, compiled for Mac OS and, and things like that, you guys probably have some pretty interesting build infrastructure. Michael, do you want to talk about that? Oh, sure. Yeah. So we have a lot of different build machines. And so one of the main advances that Condaforge has done is to take advantage of many of the free uh, continuous integration services that are on the web. And so Phil figured out really, really clever ways to get around the different limits that those CIs present. So he thought, oh, well, you know, it's not going to work to build an entire repository of recipes. So can I instead break up the one repository into one recipe per repository? And that was a really clever workaround that, uh, that made it possible to use those CIs as infrastructure. So that's part of it. At Continuum, we just have kind of a standard build system where we try to maintain compatibility with older frameworks because we support customers with um, with old CentOS 5 and, and RHEL 5 systems. But other than that, it's it's the same kind of idea. Okay. And you build it for, I can see how you would set up CI on Windows pretty easily. I see how you set it up on Linux really easily. What about Mac? <laughs> so Mac is it's got to be a story is, behind that laugh right well it's it's a little bit more awkward and the main reason why it's awkward is just Apple licensing they don't let you run virtual machines on anything but Apple hardware and so the number of people who are offering particularly free services with Apple builds is much more limited and that said you can get it on both Circle CI and Travis CI and so we use Travis CI for Conda Forge's Mac builds. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there are a few places. Like, there's a place called Mac Mini Colo where you can get a bunch of Mac Minis and stick them in some data center and they'll, like, run them for you. But, yeah, it definitely makes it harder. But you guys found a, some kind of cloud service that you can use. You don't have, like, a closet full of Macs. At Continuum, we do have a, a closet full of Macs. Okay, <laughs> great. But, I, I, you know, I really think it's this, this binary distribution thing is really excellent because... Certainly when you're getting started, it's frustrating to deal with, you know, the single compile, the single install. So just knowing that it's always going to work is, is great. But also the speed, right? You can install stuff much quicker because you don't have to wait on a build. Yes, certainly. So it's, you know, if you're a Linux nerd, then it's kind of Gentoo versus uh, Ubuntu, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. So you have a lot of different places where code's running. We talked about the three major OSs. Like, do you have compatibility for others? You, you talked about older systems, for example. How do you keep that all straight? Well, that's that's a really hard thing, actually. So the, the way that things are compatible varies by platform. And so for Mac, we kind of have to target an older platform, and then it's forward compatible. Windows is a, a weird story because on Windows, the Python version is pretty strongly tied to a particular version of, of Visual C++. And so that's limiting in terms of 
what kind of code people can actually compile. So what version do you know? Sure. Yeah. So Python 2.7 requires Visual Studio 2008. And that's um, it's just kind of a custom because that's what the upstream Python.org build is. And so in order to maintain binary compatibility, it's a good idea for everybody to, to keep that match up. But as a result of that, people can't really build C++11 software for Python 2.7 without mixing these runtimes. And when you mix runtimes, it's just kind of, it might work, it might not. You're kind of asking for instability. Yeah, no kidding. It is too bad because C++ has actually had a bit of a renaissance, right? Absolutely. And 2008 misses that renaissance. That's too old for it. Okay, interesting, interesting. Can you, any of you guys want to jump in on this? So talk about some of the challenges for community packaging. Like if I'm getting binary code delivered to me, how do I trust it? Is that really different than trusting the source coming out of PyPI? Sure, I'll, I'll chime in a little bit. I would say it's not any different from getting it from PyPI, except that if you get it from PyPI, you can at least inspect the source. Whereas if you've got a binary blob, you have to have a different level of trust. I think there's one extra level to that because PyPI, it, it is it is the original package maintainer that's uploading the package to PyPI, right? We're taking from PyPI and we're, we're downstream from that. So there is an extra level of people in between. On top of that, anybody can upload anything, any package they want to, to anaconda.org. It's up to the user to decide whether they want to use it or not. And and so there there, there are some challenges there. There's also a question of reproducibility um, in the sense that if you're getting the source, you can compile it anywhere, right? But if you're getting a binary and you want to go and change your machine, then you kind of you're missing out on the ability to rerun that compile step where you choose. Yeah. So if you get a new machine, you're always going to have to go back to install via Conda. You can't just copy the files over and regenerate it or something. If you're on different architectures, for sure, you you need to go and refetch the appropriate artifact for your hardware. Yeah. Okay. That said, do you guys do, uh, you know, I had Travis Oliphant on one of the earlier shows, and I, I feel like he said that you guys did some verification that at least the stuff that ships with Anaconda, like, mixes well together, that one package that depends on another, you know, that those are compatible versions. Is that right? Right. We do a lot of that. And um, so we have our own kind of automated scripts that test uh, our whole system together. And then ContaForge sort of does that in a more distributed way to say when they build a package, they run the test suite. We also do that. We run a few other consistency checks. But those are the kinds of things that let us make sure that everything is playing well together. I'd add there that the Anaconda distribution is extensively, we release it about quarterly and it's extensively tested manually. We have a, a whole QA team that goes through that and makes sure that each package works with, or each each of the packages, however many that make up the full distribution work together. So yeah, there's a lot of extra testing that goes into the distribution. Yeah, I think that's really great. I think that's one of the big values, not just that you don't have to be able to compile stuff to install it, but that it's taken as a whole somewhat you can trust it rather than here's a hundred little pieces individually they're probably fine how are they as a put together right yeah the downside of that is when you install the anaconda district conda install anaconda you're explicitly pinning all of your versions or all of your packages to a specific version and then when you want to update everything people get confused about i was looking for the most recent version of jupiter and i said update all why didn't i get the most recent version of jupiter so there's a little bit of a downside. That is a bit of a down downside, I guess. I did notice that. Like I want one of the things I was playing around with was trying to use Conda for my web apps. And I noticed some of the web frameworks were farther out of date with what I got out of there than I guess I, I liked. And can you talk about that? Um, whoever has the best uh, info, I guess, on how to like as things evolve. You know, so suppose I've got some package put into Conda Forge. How does the versioning on PyPI map into ContaForge? Yeah, I'll I'll try to shoot that. It's a manual process to update the recipe that creates the Conda package. And so someone has to update the recipe on on the staged recipes or on the feedstock on ContaForge. And then it's built out automatically by the CIs, which is great. The CIs save you a lot of effort. At Continuum, we don't have our CIs quite working yet. And so it's really a much more manual process to edit the recipe and then build out each of the different packages. 
with that level of effort, it's just a matter of first noticing that there is a new version available and then doing the work to uh, package it up. Sure. In the defense of Anaconda versus Condaforgia, there is clearly a huge overlap between what Anaconda does and what Condaforge does. From someone who's not part of the Anaconda team, I just want to say how much of a great job the Anaconda team actually do in providing a, a really coherent, a well put together set of packages that you can trust, you can rely on, um, they're stable. Uh, and really, I guess that's the big selling point of Anaconda. And Condaforge really isn't trying to be in that space at all. What it wants to be is the kind of the leaner, faster moving community effort. But there is no chance that Condaforge can be as well curated. Um, it can't provide the indemnity that you get from Anaconda. As a distribution, Anaconda is, is just an amazing resource to have in the community. Yeah, and it ships quarterly. So it's probably, you know, if you're willing to wait an extra month, you'll be on the new version of a lot of things anyway. If I'm an author of an, a popular open source package that's either in Anaconda or Conda Forge, what can I do to make sure that my the latest possible version is there, given that I, you know, I have to accept the release cycles and stuff? But what do I do? Is there, is there a place I talk to you guys, or what's the story? We both have places to submit pull requests to recipes. And so for uh, for the internal, for Anaconda, it's a, a recipe or a repository called Anaconda Recipes. And then for Condaforge, it's going to be the feedstock for whatever you want to improve. If you want to add it, that's a stage recipes PR. Absolutely. Okay, so let's let's maybe talk about the the recipes and feed stocks and stuff a little bit. I have one more comment that I might I might have given the wrong impression about the distribution shipping quarterly. The distribution is like one installer, one big meta package that has all kinds of stuff in it. We're constantly updating. I mean, Condaforge too, but our source, our default repositories, we're we're updating all the time, and you don't you don't have to wait for the quarter to come around to to get more recent packages most oh, of the time. Yeah, it's yeah. just okay. the Anaconda distribution and the big Anaconda meta package is updated once a quarter. Those are the packages that get all the extra QA and, and making sure that they all work together and stuff. I see what you mean. So like the DMG I got from my Mac, that thing is updated quarterly. But you're right, when I run a little green circle thing, the sort of overall environmental manager, that thing, I can go and update stuff as they come. I remember doing that quite, quite more frequently. That's cool. Let me take just a moment and tell you about a sponsor of this episode. AnacondaCon 2017 is the first conference for open data science leaders around the world and the definitive gathering place for the Anaconda crew. Whether you are a new or long-standing member of the community focused on business or technology, AnacondaCon will help you conquer your biggest data science challenges. Data science is a team sport. That's why they're offering you two tickets for the price of one to AnacondaCon 17 starting now until January 16th. Register today at talkpython.fm slash acon to take advantage of the spectacular savings. You'll get two tickets for the price of one, and you'll have the lovely tech-oriented city of Austin, Texas to share with your friend and all the top data scientists. Yeah, so let's talk about these recipes just a little bit. So let's focus on uh, Condaforge for a minute. If you go there, you can go to github.com slash, is it conda-forge, I think. And that's you've right. got, yeah, you've got a couple, uh, couple of repos. One of them is feedstocks. And that's where the accepted, those are the accepted sources that you guys pull from, right, to build packages. Right. We have a repo which holds, using Git submodules, every single individual feedstock repo that lives in ConduForge. Um, so... The, the feedstock is the place where the recipe is stored canonically and that has continuous integration in, enabled. So whenever we make changes to that recipe, it goes away and it builds it each time and makes that artifact available on the ConduForge channel. Okay. Uh, maybe tell us what is a recipe. You've got a, a couple of pieces that make that up, right? Sure. Mike, do you want to talk about recipes? Yeah, a recipe is uh, uh, it's a YAML file for one thing. And it's just kind of a way of expressing a standard of how you tell some how you tell Con to build or any other program that interprets that YAML file, where you go to build the source, what are your build options, what are the instructions that you carry out to actually do the source. And then one thing that we're adding in is how do you package the source after you've built it? Because some of the time you want to package 
different parts of what you've built into different packages. I see. That makes sense. So if basically we go to GitHub and there's a, a, a link to a sub module that gets pulled in for each one of these, if it's somewhere else other than Git, like subversion, is it still possible to stick it in there or does it have to be like copied over to like a GitHub repo or something? Conda Forge is based around the GitHub stuff, but there's no intrinsic limit to Conda build as to where a recipe has to come from. Right. Okay. Well, let's, let's talk quickly about Conda build. Michael, you're also in charge of that, right? Or working closely with that. Yes. So what's the story there? Like if I want to take a package and build it with Conda build, I've got to put together the recipe for it to work. I've got to obviously have the sources and then I get it set up and I give it to you guys and you ship it off to CI on various platforms to build out the various versions or what happens? Yeah, kind of build is really just um, a lot of orchestration of environment setup. And so building up a build environment is pretty hard. There's a lot of different pieces that go into that. And so in previous jobs as a software developer, setting up your workstation takes you know, a day or two. So what Conda Build is really for is, is abstracting that away and taking advantage of Conda environments to make that setup be very seamless. And so you list your requirements at build time and at runtime in that YAML file. And then Conda Build goes and installs that stuff. And it uh, is also doing a lot of kind of housekeeping as far as downloading the source and making sure that it's clean and then putting it in the right place and putting your prompt in the right place and activating VC Verizal, for example, <laughs> and just taking care of all of those details for you so that you don't have to learn to do it yourself or don't have to put up with doing it yourself. That's nice. So if I can get my thing to build on one platform, how hard is it to get it to build on all the platforms? It depends heavily on which package. I mean, some packages support all platforms pretty well, pretty natively. But for example, some packages that really depend very heavily on Unix tools take a little bit more handholding on Windows. There's a lot of other build tools that make life easier. So for example, CMake is something that you always get really happy when you see that somebody's using that because it makes it much easier to do cross-platform builds. Whereas some other projects will say, oh, I've got a, a make file for Unix stuff, so Linux and Mac. And then on Windows, I've got this... Um, Visual Studio 2010 solution file. So if you're on Visual Studio 2008, you probably can't use it. If you're on 2015, you have to update it, and maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. So that's the kind of thing where, where some projects are a lot easier than others. I would add, though, that for Python in particular, the recipe is usually trivial. It's usually mostly just um, there's usually about three files. There's a meta.yaml that is kind of like setup.py, except we use setup.py. And then your build script is mostly just Python setup.py install. And, and most of the time, you you don't even include that. If you look at most of the Python-based recipes on Conda Forge, there's just a single command to run that setup.py command in, a, in the meta.yaml file. I see. And that gets um, basically installed into that local Conda environment. Then you just grab what you got and ship it? Exactly. So what Conda build is doing is taking a snapshot of the files after it creates the environment and then um, another snapshot after it's done doing whatever you told it to do to install it. And then those are the files that make up your package. Okay. Th this is excellent. Yeah. So it sounds like the the conda environments play a super important role and the fact that conda can install the tool chain as well is really important in making this all work yes it's not critical so the the tool chain being a conda package is actually something that we're working on you'll soon be able to uh, to install the compiler and the runtime libraries and all that stuff as dependencies you can currently just not very many people do it because it's not supported all that well um, that's what we're moving towards our main way of doing things. And what that'll mean is it's just going to be incredibly easy to, um, you're just going to be able to volunteer your machine as a build worker. And as long as you have Conda build installed on it, it doesn't matter what else you have. It'll take care of it. Interesting. So you mean like I could go and just say, hey, I'm willing to donate some of my cycles and disk and bandwidth to be a build machine? Kind of like SETI at home or protein folding, those things? Yes, that is the dream. And there's uh, quite a few technical hurdles to get there, but it'll be really neat if we figure it out. Oh, that sounds awesome. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Okay. 
So what are some of the challenges around, you know, linking all of these other GitHub or not necessarily GitHub, Git repos into like one sort of super master feedstock <laughs> repo, you know, because you've got all the, the recipes, but they all either Anaconda or Conda Forge, like kind of link back to all these other places. Phil, do you want to answer that or should I? You're welcome to answer it. <laughs> okay, good. I, I think the hard part is how do you do the maintenance work? Because it works fantastically well to pull those sub modules into one folder just as a view or as a, a consolidated place to work from. But then if you change any of the source code, Git sub modules are just unwieldy at best um, for pushing those changes back to the parent repositories. So what Phil has created is fantastically useful for doing the editing on each repository. But if there were like, say a lot of edits you wanted to apply across a lot of different repositories, that's the kind of change that would be kind of tedious and hard to do. Yeah, absolutely. So what's that tooling look like? We don't have any idea yet. We're still working on it. <laughs> Just waiting for Phil to work his magic? Yeah, yeah, please, Phil, figure that out. So on the Conda Forge front, we actually have a, a Heroku service that's running periodically to re-render all of our feedstocks uh, whenever we make kind of fundamental template changes to, to how a feed, feedstock should look. And that service actually goes away, re-renders using the tools that we've built, and then if there are any changes, pushes a new pull request to be merged by the recipe maintainers on on github so actually it is it is tedious to have to make these changes to like we're up to 1500 git repos now it is tedious if you need to make those changes but there are some tools that we've developed to to simplify that if it's kind of a universal change that's needed yeah to clarify what a re-rendering is that is um, just like a change to the the ci setup work and the re-rendering is to adapt the CI scripts to whatever the latest standard is. I see. Okay. Yeah. And what CI tools do you use? Uh, that's the the App Veyer and the Circle CI and Travis CI. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. And when do you choose which, or do you use them all and, and sort of somehow use them in concert? Sure. That's something that Phil figured out, and he uses App Veyer for Windows and Circle CI for Linux and Travis CI for Mac. Phil, you want to explain why you made those choices? I mean, the choices were, were pretty straightforward, really. So obviously, AppVeyor is pretty much the uh, the only game in town for Windows continuous integration, or certainly was at the time. Travis CI is ubiquitous, and everyone knows it. And at the time, when we when we first developed Conda Forge, there was either you could have very limited Mac builds or amazing Linux builds, and you can have both. So we ended, we ended up having to go down the route of picking Travis for Mac. And then the alternative for Linux continuous integration, uh, which based itself off of Docker containers, was Circle CI. And it was just a breeze to use. The, the Docker integration was amazing because it allowed us to set up the tool chain really quickly. Um, yeah, they've all been fantastic services. They kind of get a bit of a bad reputation for being slow sometimes. Um, but every single one of those continuous integration services has upgraded Conda Forge to their, their premium services for free, just as part of improving the ecosystem and kind of supporting the Conda Forge community. So extremely great. Yeah, that's really great of them. Yeah, nice job. Do you think you you guys, you think Conda Forge or the, the recipes, uh, Feedstock is that what it's called, is the thing on GitHub with the most sub-modules? <laughs> oh, good question. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, we're we're up to fifteen hundred uh, recipes, so about yeah. about fifteen hundred. So it's pretty high. It's got to be in the top five if it's not number one. I bet it's number one. That that's really really interesting. Really interesting. Uh, so that's. Uh, can you talk about the growth uh, and some of the challenges, Phil, of Conda Forge? Sure. So I mean, we publicly announced Conda Forge less than twelve months ago, and the uptake curve on on it was crazy. In in the first few months, we'd grown to. 100 contributors and kind of 300 recipes or something like that. It really is quite amazing that the infrastructure scaled so well. I mean, we designed the architecture to have the ability to make lots of Git repos, but we had really no idea whether GitHub were going to limit the number of Git repos we could have in, under the one organization. 
you know, the continuous integration services, we had no idea whether they'd be able to cope with us. so many kind of registered Git repositories. There were some, there's some real challenges that actually just fell out quite nicely. Yeah, it sounds like the tooling worked really well, actually. Yeah, as we're becoming more and more mature, the bottleneck, it turns out, has not been the hardware. Actually, the biggest bottleneck probably is me. And <laughs> just kind of developing the governance and the kind of delegated authorities to kind of make decisions without my uh, intervention just takes time and is actually it's kind of the fluffy thing that's much harder than the software for me at least. <laughs> there's no script for that is there no there's no continuous integration service for that hey everyone let me take just a quick moment and tell you about a new sponsor of the show mongodb university mongodb is one of the fastest growing job skills on the market long ago when i was getting into mongodb i took one of their free courses on mongo university it was a great way to get up and running with my first app. MongoDB University offers free seven-week courses on MongoDB designed to teach you everything you need to know about how to build a MongoDB-based app. This course will cover basic installation, JSON, schema design, querying, inserting data, indexing, and working with the Python driver, of course. After completing this course, you should have a good understanding how applications are built on top of MongoDB using Python. Plus, you'll have a great foundation for preparing for the MongoDB Developer Certification Exam. I hope you can join me as a MongoDB University alumnus. Sign up for the free seven-week course at talkpython.fm slash mongo. Kale, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the projects under uh, github.com slash conda. Sure. So there, like a few that are interesting to me is like there's conda and then there's constructor. What, what's the story of those? Yep. So, so there's conda and conda build. Those are the two big ones that we've been talking about. There's Constructor, and Constructor is actually a lot of what we use to build the single installer, the Anaconda distribution installer, at least the, the .sh ones. And so it creates a self-extracting binary into a single .sh or executable, executable file, will unroll itself and install all those packages for you. That's what Constructor is. Some of the other ones, Conda M is on there, but it's deprecated. It's been pulled into the Conda repo now so that they can be tested together and shipped together and versioned together and, and stuff like that. There's a Capsule repo, that, and Capsule is a bit of an experiment for Continuum right now. It's really uh, focused on more managing data science projects, starting services that are dependencies for data science projects like a Redis database or, or something like that. So it takes all the ideas of Conda's package management, environment management, adds services, adds running processes to it, and then adds data to it as well. So data shape, schema, stuff like that. Wow, that sounds pretty interesting. So like if I, if I want to do something where I'm going to need a Jupyter Notebook server running, I'm going to need like Redis, like you said, and, and a few other things like that could sort of do that all in one shot. And then in a portable way so that you can move projects around um, to from different from a like a, a local dev environment to to something that is sort of running in production and against your production database. Even I, Conda, one of the great things is it's completely OS agnostic, right? So being able to port your port your projects across OSs and share your share your projects that way too. Cool. And like, how does that help for reproducibility? Like if I'm a scientist and I've written a paper, can I make a capsule thing and go, and this is the thing that will let you go and do it? I could see that happening. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Very. Yeah, very, very cool. The, the starting point, if you want to uh, examine your data or my data yourself, here's all the tools you need to do it. Run a command and and you're in. Okay, excellent. And Phil, how about the Conda Forge, Conda Smithy thing on GitHub that you guys have? What's that? Right. So as I say, we've got like 1,500 recipes now that are sitting uh, each in their own Git repository. Um, and the Git repository that holds a recipe is called the feedstock. And as you can imagine, there is duplication of things like the readme and the license and the continuous integration scripts. And we didn't want to have that kind of duplication where we had to manage that manually. So Ponder Smithy really is the, the tool that is the, the cookie cutter, the, the templating engine that takes a recipe and turns it into this Git repository. I see. So if I owned a package and I wanted to get started, maybe I'd check out Conda Smithy to like build right. what I'm going to start with? Yeah, you, you can render your recipe into a into a feedstock and see how that would look and actually that's precisely what we do to turn recipes proposed to conda forge into feedstocks 
And the tooling in Conda Smithy also includes the ability to make the new GitHub repository. It registers all the webhooks, so you can kind of automatically register Travis, Circle, and AppFire continuous integration. It just kind of packages everything neatly into one place so that we don't have to repeat ourselves 1,500 times. Yeah, absolutely, and make it easier for people to contribute. All right, guys, looks like we're running running out of time. I think we might have to leave it there for, for Conda. But let me ask you each uh, two questions. I always ask at the end of the show, since there's three of you, let you, you go kind of quick. There's, first of all, there's over 90, I think 95,000 packages on PyPI and many of them on Conda Forge and uh, within, within Anaconda. Can you each give me maybe one of your favorite packages, not that's necessarily popular, but you think is really cool that people should learn about? Phil, go first. I'm going to pick a package which is extremely popular, um, but it's so exciting. I'm thrilled that it exists. My favorite package is Dask and Dask Distributed. I think it's just an amazing, amazing solution to a really big problem within the community. Yeah, so this is like for parallelizing data pipeline type processing? Right, exactly. Yeah, and parallel uh, array computation, uh, just really exciting. All right, Dask. That's very cool. Kale? Yeah, the two packages that popped into my mind are Mahmoud Hashimi's uh, Boltons. I love that. I use it all the time. And then Matt Rockland's uh, PyTools, SciTools, both fairly low level, but both awesome, awesome libraries for writing general Python and use them both all the time. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I've, I've checked out Boltons. Not the other one. I'll have, I'll have to have a look at that. They're both, uh, you know, both sound great. And Michael? PyTest. <laughs> <laughs> yes, by test to make sure all these automated builds actually have some sort of meaning, right? Yeah, and also just all the plugins that go with PyTest, let it do incredible things um, in very expressive ways. I'm very, very thankful for PyTest. Excellent. All right, Michael, when you write some Python code, what editor do you open up? SpaceMax. SpaceMax. All oh, right on. Kale? For Python code in particular, it's PyCharm. PyCharm. Okay, cool. And Phil? I'm mostly a Vim user, even on Windows. Okay. Yeah, yeah, very nice. And I guess the legitimate real Vim and the, the Unix tools are supposed to be there soon. Are they already there? I'm not sure. But the, the Unix... In Conda? No, no. In uh, Windows 10, is supposed to have the Ubuntu subsystem in it uh, natively pretty soon. Maybe that'll even help with some builds. Who knows? But yeah, yeah, very cool. Do we have Vim for Conda? Has it been written? Does anybody know? I'm just curious. I don't know. I wrote, I wrote Nano a long time ago. But, um, is it on Conda about Vim. Phil, do you have no. Vim? Compiled no. yet on Conda Forge? Okay. Not that I know of, but then, you know, I'm completely out of the loop. So. Sounds like somebody should take that one on. Awesome. All right. Any final call to actions? Like, how can people contribute to this overall project that you guys are all working on? Vim for Conda Forge, apparently. <laughs> That's step one. Oh, okay. I have one. We released, uh, I released Conda 4.3.0 today. It's a huge feature release. There's uh, it, over almost 900 commits past the 4.2 feature release or feature branch. The, it's released on, we have a Conda Canary program. So just like Chrome has a Canary program, I kind of ripped off the title. Plus there's some alliteration. So Conda Canary, and you just add a, a Conda, Conda config, add channels, Conda Canary, you add the ch Conda Canary channel, check it out, use it, let us know what you think of it. The change log is extensive and we'll be releasing it general availability probably on the last day of 2016. Oh, perfect. A nice New Year's gift. That's awesome. So yeah, people check that out. Anything else? I'd say if anybody is missing a package on um, Conda that is in PyPy and it would make your life easier, then please submit a, a recipe to Staged Recipes. And the, the main thing I would emphasize about Conda Forge is the, the really incredible thing about it is the community. There is such an amazing pool of expertise there on how to build software. And I've learned a lot and anybody stands to learn a lot just by getting involved there. Okay, excellent. Yeah, that, absolutely easy to contribute and, and please do so. Any of you guys going to be at AnacondaCon in uh, Austin in February? Oh, yes. Kale? We'll be around. Yep, absolutely. Nice. Phil, are you traveling like halfway around the world? Unfortunately, I won't be there for uh, AnacondaCon this year. All right. So if people make it, go say hi to uh, Michael and Kale and we can tweet tweet at phil all right guys thanks so much for being on the show it's been great to talk about conda i think it's a really great project overall that you guys are working on so thanks for that thank you michael okay. thank thanks, you michael. this has been another episode of talk python to me today's guests have been phil ellison kale franz and michael sarahan and this episode has been sponsored by continuum analytics and mongodb university thank you both for supporting the show
Whether you want to hear the keynote by Ryan Curran from Forrester Research, meet the guys behind Anaconda, or just mingle with high-end data scientists, you need to find your way to Austin, Texas for AnacondaCon this February. Start at talkpython.fm slash acon. Get the skills you need to build your Python apps on top of the most successful and in-demand document database at MongoDB University. Take a free class by visiting talkpython.fm slash mongo. Are you or a colleague trying to learn Python? Have you tried books and videos that just left you bored by covering topics point by point? Well, check out my online course, Python Jumpstart by Building 10 Apps at talkpython.fm slash course to experience a more engaging way to learn Python. And if you're looking for something a little more advanced, try my Write Pythonic Code course at talkpython.fm slash pythonic. Be sure to subscribe to the show. Open your favorite podcatcher and search for Python. We should be right at the top. You can also find the iTunes feed at slash iTunes, Google Play feed at slash play, and direct RSS feed at slash RSS on talkpython.fm. Our theme music is Developers, Developers, Developers by Corey Smith, who goes by Smix. Corey just recently started selling his tracks on iTunes, so I recommend you check it out at talkpython.fm slash music. You can browse his tracks he has for sale on iTunes and listen to the full-length version of the theme song. This is your host, Michael Kennedy. Thanks so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Smix, let's get out of here. Stating with my voice, there's no norm that I can fit within. Haven't been sleeping. I've been using lots of rest. I'll pass the mic back to